Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is April 8th, 2015, and uh, we are continuing to talk about Walk My World. Um, the uh, Some of the people who organized it and had students involved in it in, uh, at various levels. Um, we've also invited some uh, students, and others have invited students, and we're expecting other people to interrupt us as we talk here. Um, but uh, you know what, Stephanie, you weren't in the uh, show two weeks ago, so why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about Walk My World from your perspective. <laughs> from my perspective. Yeah. Um, well, I'm Stephanie Loomis and um, started Walk My World as a student, spent this year as an organizer, and am planning to incorporate it into my curriculum for my Introduction to Composition courses next year. And I'm doing uh, some research with using Twitter as a teaching tool and hoping to take all of this into a dissertation in the next couple of years. Stephanie, where are you located? Uh, normally I'm located near Atlanta, but today I happen to be located at the beach in South Carolina. Oh, so you Were you with us last time or not? I was. You were? I was. I was horribly backlit because yeah, my normal computer... I'm sorry, back. sorry. Guys, correct me if I'm making sense. <laughs> well, welcome back again. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, great. Yeah. Um, Kate, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Do you want to introduce yourself again? Yep. Um, my name is Kate Booth, and um, it's currently the 9th of April here in Australia, and um, <laughs> in the future. And I'm a, a primary school teacher at Tyala Public School um, on the mid north coast of New South Wales, um, in a, a little town called um, Coffs Harbour. So, yeah, lovely spot. Great. And um, I said this before because uh, I lop off the top of this. If uh, we are waiting for maybe some other students, um, it, is it proper to call them pre-service students? But some of them are already teaching. The teachers who are new teachers, new to the profession, some are just getting in. You guys can correct me on that <laughs> too, a little bit. Um, and we're hoping some of those folks will join us as well. But Ian, do you want to describe? what you do and who those students are when we talk about students. Yeah, so it's it's a, um, so one of the things that we started unpacking last time was that we have, you know, Walk My World is an open learning experience, but it's also open research. Um, and so last year, the first version of this started where I had uh, two sets of my students. I had a, a pre-service class of students and then I had uh, a group of students that were in my uh, six-year instructional tech program. So it's for uh, in-service teachers, veteran teachers. Um, they were doing it at my university. We had a couple other universities, you know, joining in. Um, and so after last year, we reached out to some of the people that were really influential, and we said, you know, hey, join us. And so Kate and Stephanie and others joined in. And we basically said, let's open this up. Let's all, you know, we all can learn from one another. Um, so this year was the same thing. We had a, a group of pre-service educators. We had some in-service or veteran teachers. Um, a lot of people basically joining in. And then the nice thing is that you also have K-12 students. You have, you know, because it's open, you have a couple other people joining in. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a good mix of people. And I think that the theme this year really lent to that experience because we're looking at identity and playing with digital text and tools to unpack what we mean by identity and really, I mean, there were a couple of the, I, I'd be interested in hearing Kate and, and Stephanie talk about, there were a couple of our learning events that were, um, we really dug in deep to the idea of identity and we got a little ethereal or a little I don't know. It, it, I'd be interested to see what they took from it, but it was really fun having people play with the learning events and really dig in to see what they get. Uh, Greg. Yeah, um, my name is uh, Greg McVary. Um, I'm in Connecticut as well at uh, Southern Connecticut State University, and I've uh, been with Ian, Kate, and Stephanie now. For the, we did. We were all together last year, um, and together this year. Uh, 
And I was um, basically a behind-the-scenes guy this time around, um, pushing and annoying and, and just kind of playing um, as I didn't have students enrolled. I was a student myself um, in Walk My World this time. Um, and, you know, really kind of just enjoyed seeing what has happened. What I'm interested now, though, is, uh, you know, we're, we're at week 10, and we're seeing people we've never met or don't know their instructors that are in, like, week four. Um, and uh, just had a, um, last night had a, um, a, clo a coder dojo, like, webmaker club in India send me out a high five on Walk My World because I helped them out with a problem. And so they, they, saw, the, they saw the high five um, challenge and uh, all sent me a big picture. So it's interesting to kind of, you know, the hashtag might be, be spreading beyond our little project, which would be fun if it really does take off. Or, you know, when, when Stephanie runs it with her class and we just have these ten cycles of, that are just, you know, repeating, which would be kind of fun to watch. And so, I mean, that's one, that's a good question is, um, in looking at the chat room, there's a couple, you know, people that can chime in there. Um, you know, in, in the open learning teachers teaching teachers that we had a couple weeks ago or a month ago, you know, I suggested that we should have different versions of MOOCs and have like a, like a mentored or a chaperoned open learning experience. And so what is the appropriate reaction? So, you know, now that we've gone through and we've said openly to people, hey, the, the learning events are there, follow through and follow along with all of us. But as organizers, what is acceptable? What's appropriate? How long do you follow along and welcome and guide people? And then at what point do you let it become its own entity? Yes. Well, you know, Paul's been doing it forever with uh, your voices. Well, I, I, let me, well, let me, yeah, but let me rephrase the question a little bit. I mean, or rethink, what, what I've been thinking about, I mean, I think I'm asking the same thing, really. Mm -hmm. But, like, there's a universe now that's been developing, right? There's a universe of CL MOOC. There's a universe of, um, uh, you know, Dave Cormier starting up Rizzo 15, Rizo 15 um, again, so there's Rizo, there's that sort of approach. Obviously, um, I kind of feel like you, what you all have been doing, it fits within that universe in some yeah. way. There's, there's uh, you know, 106, what is it, DS 106, there, so there's that whole approach. So, like, how do you guys see this fitting into that universe? And is, we all play in those. We, we we play in those universes. We have kind of a, you know, there's like a we steal, we poach. Um, you know, I I've I've dabbled a little bit in DS106. Quit that pretty quickly. I haven't done um, uh, Dave Cormier's the Rizo uh, class because I don't know if it's just on Facebook or where it is. If it's on Facebook, it's just I, I'm I'm not gonna be there. Um, <laughs> no, it's 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 very similar to to. To your approach, I think actually, uh, it's all over the place. And just that's has, what I love. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, it, it is. I'm I'm starting to think about it as it's what we're we're developing our distributed classrooms in, instead of uh, destination classrooms. You know, where we've always been thinking about um, MOOCs or even online education as how do we build the best LMS? How do I build the best website? It was the best destination versus a distribution model, you know, where it's just let it have people publishing it on their own list spaces wherever those are and just share that out to as many places as they can. So if some of the groups, I was just joking about Facebook, but if some of the groups in Walk My World want to play there, they can. If they want to play on Twitter, they can. Um, Kevin asked us about if we had a lot of cross-platform, um, but we didn't. But I think that was deliberate on our parts because we were trying to, a lot of us were working with new teachers and we want to show them kind of Twitter as a place to play, so we don't we're not as we're not as cross platformy as the other ones, um, but we just it is this idea of you're publishing your own stuff and your own site. We give you and then th we just throw it out there on the internet. I don't know if that made sense. It's Stephanie, I got a question for you and Kate as well. Um, why is this important? You know why? Hey Alicia, you know. <laughs> Not a problem. Hey, so Stephanie, Kate, you know, and then and Alicia, why is this stuff important? Like, why why did you 
gravitate to it last year, and then why did you want to put up with us this year? Like, why is this so important? Is there any value in what we're doing? Yes, there's. It's. I'm. I'm not. I'm not the uh, the newbie teacher that that some of my cohort members are. But when I saw this, I saw it as an extension of the old way we used to pass notes in school back in the day before we all had cell phones, and the whole concept of of kind of the secret communication that's really not so secret. It adds an element of mystery almost to it. And when you put a hashtag on it, you don't know what's going to come from somebody who is across the world or across the nation. And I think there's great value just from a multicultural aspect of joining in with these learning events in in ways and with people that you wouldn't normally interact with. And for me, it's been really cool to make connections with people in New York and in Connecticut and in Arizona and in Australia and say, wow, look at all of these cool things we have in common. So I think it's a great tool for building I don't, building relationships and through relationships building identity and then examining literature based on these new lenses that we have, which I think is a really cool thing for this generation. Um, and I'm going to hop in there with that analyzing literature because I think and I, I talked about that a little bit in my my reflection and it was Paul really the question you left us two weeks ago well what you know what should we change what should we do differently and each we tried to anchor every event in a text and then a, a make like so you had, had some kind of textual analysis and you had to do something um, but what I saw looking back through the you know how many things were annotated or how many things were referenced in the Everybody did the makes, but we didn't get into the really the textual analysis as much. Um, and maybe we should. Maybe it should just be you know that that make. But um, and that that might be something as we as organizers need to talk about. But uh, yeah, that was my little so, takeaway from last week. And and I, I wish there was uh, Karen if you're around, join us now because because Seal Mook is all about makes, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's about making things. Well, it's about making things. <laughs> what, do you want to? You can represent it if you like. I yeah, but and it's about connecting and and like reflecting on the make. But but you you have that in common, right? With yeah, I mean that's one of the things that you said earlier that I you know I I talked about this a couple of weeks ago that to me the CL MOOC was you know I said this in the last time you know it was like the gold standard of of open learning events. You know I I tell my students in in my six year program. You know, I get involved in different things online, specifically the CL MOOC, because I need to step my game up before I teach you, because I always need to be one step ahead of you. You know, so I learn new things in the CL MOOC every year so that I can have new stuff to talk about next year at the next ed camp, at the next unconference, at the next, you know, LRA presentation that blows your doors off, and I get it from the CL MOOC. So I think that we are, you know, we are the the... The, the stepsister or the the black sheep of the family in the seal move tree or something. So I think it's we're all related. I so think we are. It, it, by I mean, it's my interest to to find. And if the, it doesn't happen now, we can. It'll it'll keep happening. I think is to kind of drill down and, and figure out what it is that makes this um, open experience online distributed classroom. Um, and and part of it feels like that there's not one organizer too, like that the committee of organizers um, feels like an important part, and I know that happens in CL MOOC too, like throwing throwing around the ideas first before they go out. That so that's one element, would you say? Plus well, another like big challenge that yeah, well yeah. another challenge we have is some of our people, some of our ter participants, and this is one of our challenges. They are taking classes and they are getting grades for it. Yeah, that's one of the challenges that we have is that you know it is a MOOC, it is an open learning experience, but some people are there. You know, it's the mandated tweet. They're there because they have to be, and so it's like that's one of the 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 Power dirty point. underbellies to this. Yeah, and if any students are trying to get in to tell us what that was like, please keep trying. <laughs> I told them if they said anything, their grades would suffer. <laughs> Great. <laughs> That's exactly what we're looking for. 
I do theoretically have a couple of students coming. I'm wondering, I was late because I was trying to get the, I couldn't get the joining link to work for some reason, so there may be other people in that position. Um, but I actually have found this year that um, it was really important for my students to get in and to spend some time actually participating. Um, last year I kind of made it optional and no one was really into it. Um, and they were scared, and some people posted a couple of tweets, and so this year I said, okay, you've got to do at least five. It's part of your grade to do at least five of these things, and I ended up with students who did the whole thing. Wow. Um, and, and that was pretty cool. And for me, it was, it was one of these things, I was thinking about the course this year, and I thought, you know, if we are talking about digital literacies, if we are talking about communicative composition, writing, visuals, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then they've got to find other people besides them um, and besides the class out there. Um, and, and so I'm really glad I did it. That's why um, it was really generous. So what was it like for them to be sort of, um, I don't know, on some level prescribed to do this? Right? Do you think? I mean, you, it sounds like once you sort of set out the standard of how many, they, they actually enjoyed it more on some level. Some of them did and some of them didn't. Um, mm -hmm. And we actually, we talked about it not this week but last week. And, and the conversation was super interesting because I had a couple of them who sort of started off and, and talked about the idea of presenting a really safe kind of self. Um, a lot of them, a lot of mine are either interns in classrooms right now or they're going to be interns next year and so they're hyper aware of, um, of the fact that their students are watching them on social media or they're trying to get jobs for next year. Um, mm -hmm. And so they were really safe about it. Mm -hmm. And then I had a couple of students sort of about halfway, two-thirds of the way through, just decide that they really wanted to share stuff that reflected them. Um, and, and they just kind of went for it. And, and it was really, and it was really funny, because I, I said in class, I said, that, that seemed kind of risky to me. And, <laughs> and they were like, yeah, it, yeah, it was kind of risky. But that was me. And, and I decided I just wanted to do it. And that it was important. And so I did it. And then I was really into it and finished the rest of the events. <laughs> and that, that happened for two students, and then the other three of them were still not so sure. They were like, okay, well, I did the ones that felt safe. I did the ones that, that seemed okay to share with people who I didn't really know, um, other educators, professors, students, teachers, um, and, and that was kind of it. So I don't. I thought that was really interesting. I don't quite know what to make of it yet. Well, maybe yeah. we can in the tasks. You know, we give a little bit more of a menu of choices. They, maybe they pick the teachy, the teachery kind of stuff. So we make like an option of because now you have me thinking, Paul, that maybe we're stumbling on how do you do? You know, we've always talked about how do you schoolify these kinds of out of informal learning practices, and maybe we're kind of stumbling on a way of of how you could do connected courses where there's, you know, stakes attached to them. That's what a grade is, it's like, you know. Um, and maybe we're kind of stumbling on a format where you can, but we do see we do see that people that are going to do the bare minimum. And um, Somebody on Twitter um, told me, well, you can't blame students for picking the, the path of least resistance. Yeah. Um, that's Adults do it all the time. Yeah. Uh, and But maybe this idea, I'm, I'm thinking of this idea, because that's what we wanted them to do, with play with identities. They were projecting a professional identity by not sharing, they're still projecting that professional identity online. Right. Um, and so maybe we have to think about, you know, giving more of a menu of options. Um, well, I mean, it's yeah. in the, I'm reading all the reflections as people apply for bat, their badge at the end, and most of the, the people have stated, the, the ones that complete, they basically say, you know, um, because it was 10 weeks, one week per learning event, it was kind of tough to stay up with it. Um, I wish I had more time, or I wish I had like less learning events, um, you know. But I wish that, you know, pretty much all the the respondents said, you know, I wish I had taken the time and and played more and experienced a little bit more and and tried to open up. You know, I 
they were like, well, out of the ten events or the eight events that I did, two or three were just pictures that I shared, and I and it was just me sharing a tweet. But then I had a couple that I really opened up, and I tried to play with popcorn or other tools. And when I did that, I really I got a lot from it, and I wish I did that more often. So that's the hard part is, you know, for my students, they're in a pretty intense grad program, and they have work to get done. And so at times there is a place for just share a tweet with an image or just share an animated GIF, just get something out there. But at other times, really play if you have the time to. Yeah. I heard the same thing from my students. Um, and from a couple of them I also heard periodically. I really meant to spend half an hour doing this thing, and I spent three hours doing it because it was awesome. <laughs> that too. <laughs> and I'd say to my students, you know, your homework is... You need, to, you need to go play, you need to explore with digital text and tools, and you need to use Twitter. And that's, that's, the, the, that's my expectation. If you try for a little bit and it doesn't work, as long as you try, that's all that matters to me. Go play, try new things. I want you to be creative. I want to problematize your version of text. I want you to break things online. I want you to go and play and try something new. And if you do that, I'll be happy. You know, so it's a really low level of, vet, of entry for at least my students. Um, Maybe we need to have, move to a two week cycle. I um, mean, we're probably like I was thinking about it. Like C courses had a two week. I think CL MOOC had a two week. Um, I, in the middle of my semester, I had to switch to a two week cycle. Or maybe we do a. Um, Maybe we do a, a major, I don't want to say mini make, major make, but like there's like the, not the daily challenges because I, I couldn't imagine trying to publish one every day. I don't know how Kevin does that. Um, I have a, but the challenge is like I have another MOOC I'm running now, another class that goes on two week schedules, and then all that happens is people wait till the end of the second week and then do all the work. So, <laughs> yeah. That's, hey, what that's, do think? that's what? Really true when you start talking about high school students. They they don't do anything. The time management is, is a learned thing, and when you've got a bunch of teenagers trying to they're going to wait till the last second no matter what. So, and I here's my thought on the, um, on the cycle. Because there's no real end date, if, if in the classroom you say you have to complete 8 of 10, then that way you kind of deal with the life happens schedule thing rather than extending the whole thing out to 20 weeks, which could be really burdensome, especially since most of us do tend to wait until the very last second. I'm weird because I loved it so much as a student that I had to finish all my other work first, and doing the Walk My World project was my reward to myself, so I could spend all the time I wanted because I just really got into the whole thing. But I think making some of the making giving giving them a choice to skip two of them because they've got exams in other places. That's a good that's idea. A solution to that. Why did you say that you loved it? I think it may be partly because I'm an artist as well as a teacher, and the idea of creating something new and learning something new and examining something from a different point of view appeals to the artistic part of me. Um, one of my favorite authors is David Duchemin, and he's a, a photographer, and he's written some fantastic stuff. He's an excellent writer, but he talks about the idea that you have to take risks when you explore, and you have to take your time when you explore, and you can't just go out and shoot a million pictures and hope for a good one, but you, you need to think about what you're trying to say, and I loved the idea that in Twitter, you've got one link, or you've got 140 characters, and you really have to think carefully, what's my message here, and how can I best communicate it? And I loved that challenge of the whole thing. It was just, to me, it was just really a fun, new way of expression. Kate, um, your students, did they dip in once in a while, or do all 10, or how, how many did they end up doing? Um, my kids, they did, no, not all 10, because we're actually on school holidays now. So, you know, we're only starting our school year as such. So um, um, I'll storify all their links um, uh, but and do 10. But we actually did the, um, the um, learning events that uh, resulted in CREATE. And it was really interesting listening to what Greg had to say because as a teacher, like I really enjoyed following it, um, and I'm going to get 
if I can give a perspective from being a new teacher. So I was only a pre-service teacher two years ago because I, as I said earlier or last um, mm -hmm. um, interview, um, I graduated in 2013. So actually listening to Ian and uh, Steph and Alicia and uh, Greg talk about their pre-service teacher really resonates with me. So, but um, my kids, we did all the create. So Greg mentioned about that, um, and I did see that last year with um, um, the Robert Hass poetry uh, as a as an adult and as a teacher. I loved his poetry. I really, but because I was using it with my students, um, obviously we, yeah, it was what they did with the um, with the poem but um, Greg made the comment that perhaps you know they didn't go so deeply like uh, you weren't examining the uh, the, 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 um, the the poem so much or the literature so much this year it was more sort of focused on the make but I have to say for my children and because obviously um, I really ran with this as an intensive literacy sort of digital literacy project and having five to seven year olds 20 of them. We really did pull apart um, the literature as best uh, as best as we uh, we really went into it in a lot of detail. So um, as much as you can, and that's um, uh, why I and I actually truly believe that as a result of that, round week six, all of all of a sudden, my kids who I spoke about before have very low literacy um, levels. Um, suddenly we completed a little um, a creative writing project on the book by Margaret Wild Fox and I really believe that the way we pulled apart the, um, the, the, the learning events and I really tried to foster them having safe discussions and, um, um, and, and allowing their little of minds to sort of um, think about what does something look like and smell like and feel like and you know because these kids are very visual um, and you know we'd they'd run and they'd run and grab a dictionary if they and, and I'd have to sort of explain break down a difficult word perhaps or something that this this actual um, project has really helped their ability in literature in um, in pulling it apart because yeah by about Actually, week eight, I did had to do an assessment on their creative writing, and they actually drew on. I could hear, I could see it in their writing as much as, you know, you, it's interesting. Um, um, yeah. So, um, for me, they really, we re really did go into the literature um, heavily because um, that was important, and that I, you know. Um, uh, you life lesson learn like a six I had to still show yeah how I could link it to the curriculum outcomes I still have to please my school I still have to please um, so yeah and that was a goal but so it was fabulous so we haven't um, done anything pretty much from uh, week seven is it week hold on what was the last um, it was mirrors and then after mirrors what was Here. after mirrors Ian I sorry Greg journey right heroes yeah we didn't like I could have I really was hoping to fit that one in but uh, the last two weeks of term and with me being away for the week was a little crazy um, and I wanted to focus on the Fox um, by Margaret Wilde um, I just wanted to see how they could come up with something um, themselves and um, yeah I, I put that up on the blog anyway that was but that was yeah yeah, put okay. your link in the, the chat in the uh, TT or, or in this chat, or send it on Twitter again, Kate, so we can share it to everybody. Um, the because Fox. You, yeah, well, you well, you're just your blog links because you um yeah. you did such a great job of documenting your students' learning and the the mm -hmm. literature stuff. Like, I want to use it with my pre-service teachers. Be like, look, this is what you can do in a classroom. Um, yeah, you can. You know, you talk about. I can really relate to um, um, when Ian and Greg and Lisa, you're talking about where the students say they're 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 busy, you know, or it's in, an intensive grad program or anything like that. Well, you know, um, what three years ago I was doing my learning technologies unit, um, but S Steph, um, I'm just wondering whether because and I'm, you're obviously younger than I am, um, I'm about to hit fifty, um, but um, 
I want this whole thing about mature age students that we do tend to, you know, and you read all the memes about God help us having mature age students in the class, you know. Um, but I had a lot of mates, um, a lot of my friends, sort of this uni group that I hung out with um, for the four years while I was there. Um, a lot of the, the, the guys, they, they have gone on to do fantastic stuff, but the, they coined the phrase, P's are degrees. Well, yes. so P is a pass. And I was, you know, these mature age students, I was, you know, enjoying getting my HDs. I never thought I could get HDs. And my God, when I got my first one, that was it. I was, uh, I was after, not after them, but it just naturally evolved, you know, once I got into learning how to write and please the lecturers. But, um, yeah, P is a degree. So when you've got um, something that's mandated that you, you have to do, and we, you know, in learning tech, you had to tweet. Well, the amount of noise that my fellow cohort made, oh, what are we tweeting for? You know, what's this Twitter? Um, and even Did you for see me, that same stuff with your kids? Sorry? Did you see that same, the stuff Alicia was talking about and I was talking about, about some of the kids really dove in and they were like Stephanie and they loved it and then you had other students that were like, oh, I don't, I don't have time for this. Did you see those same sort of behaviors and attitudes from your tiny tykes? Oh, uh, oh, from my little ones? Yeah. No, no, because the Twitter account, obviously for legality, um, yeah. a, a lot in New South Wales where I am, a lot of teachers, and a, we're, we're quite connected. I think maybe it's because we're in Australia. We're so isolated globally as, uh, you know, you can drive for hours and hours and you haven't made it across Australia. I was in a, um, um, we're also, you know, we've only got, what, 23 million odd people in the whole country and I was on this Twitter chat with text. I, I just kind of fell into it with this Texas Ed chat or whatever it is and I quickly... Oh. We don't get to hear about Texas Ed. Bring in, and I thought I'm just going to check the population of Texas, and it was something like 27 million. I nearly killed over, you know. So, I think um, um, how I looked at it using Twitter with my kids um, is that we have a lot of there's a lot of bad news, and this is maybe offers a little bit of something different. There's a lot of bad news that comes in from around the world um, regarding the world with Syria, and this is the political side. And part of the driver for me was not just the global connections and letting these children make these wonderful connections and feel valued, as I went into detail about in the last interview, um, but also to actually realise that, you know what, we are we are joined by this commonality that um, there's this one thing walk my world, and it is a great little place you know and it is a happy place and that they um, because I have a few children that have um, and it's the same all over the world refugee kids um, but also kids who will come in and talk ah oh, I saw this in Syria or I saw this on the news you know um, and I just wanted to show them that the world, we can actually make these connections and the world really is a, um, a really pretty neat place as well and it can be a safe place. So I, I yeah, that's just a different um, area. I okay, Twitter has been a fantastic, yeah, to find fantastic projects, sorry Steph, um, for my students and age is not a deterrent. I don't I really, you know, if it looks great, and uh, um, yeah, my I'm into it, and I. But and before, before we go to Stephanie, I I just wanted to check the the other train you were on there by talking about your co students to, um, earlier was what something about was something about the importance of of choice in all of this, right? Um, that people yeah. are choosing to do this. Is that right? It's got to be. We always sorry. We always go on about. You know, at school, it's the big word that's or two words that have banded around. It's got to be authentic and meaningful. Mm -hmm. You know, this connected to a big world problem, big world issue, make it real, and you've got the kids engaged. Well, I think that's maybe the same as well for um, uni. Uh, you know, I know my co they say, you know, hold on, what has this got to do with teaching? What is, what, when am I going to use this? You know, I just 
um, the other, I've just been having a chat before this um, with my friend who got a scholarship to Ohio University. She's over there at the moment. And we're having this huge discussion about this school in New York that something, the Something Academy, no, where they let Front kids, Academy. it's big news over here. Yeah, the it's New York Front Times, that's yep. for the, just to catch your audience up, the, the Success Academy um, just Success had a big Academy. article. Front page <laughs> news. Hit yeah. the Australian newspapers yesterday. We're about to have nap plan, and you know that kids are allowed to wet themselves before they, you know, to to, to to you know that's and that tests are that's what it's all about. And my uh, friend Donnell, who's at Ohio University, was saying talking about how schools parents have so much control or say in schools, well in Ohio or there, and that land taxes somehow land taxes fund the schools. Is that right? That's, yes, that is how we fund our schools. We tax the people that are home. So <laughs> if you live in a town with a lot of rich houses, you get a lot of rich taxes. It's um, I, it's just like a whole different world. When I I went, what you? Anyway, it's like a whole. We all speak the same language, but wow, it's really different over there. And it's it's not but, right or it's wrong. I don't know, but yeah, it's wrong. It's, it's wrong. It's, uh, you said that. I don't want to ruin our relationship. <laughs> no, no, it's Australian wrong. Relationship. <laughs> but yeah, really, um, yeah, that was an eye opener. Wow. <laughs> so, all right, I don't know how we're going to get this back. But oh, we, yeah. we can. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> so, I can. Stephanie, you wanted to say something. Though. Go ahead. Um, well, I wanted to first address Kate's question. First of all, Kate, thank you. I love you. I am 50 already, so I've got you there. Um, but I noticed that with my with my cohorts last year, the younger ones were very much. I just want to get through this program. I'm just gonna, and my my thought being, you know, having having grown children the same age as my cohort members, my thought was I'm here to learn as much as I can because to, I've done the get a job thing, and so. I kind of turned into a mentor to my cohort that even though we were in the same classes, I was like, no, guys, look, this is really cool. You have no idea this opportunity you have here. And some of them jumped on the bandwagon, and some of them just said, whatever, Caesar degrees, and it's all good. But the other thing that you said that, that really sparked me was the idea that underneath it all, all, we, we really are all the same and I've been doing all this multicultural stuff this semester and what really strikes me about it is I don't know about Australia but in the US we focus on how different we are and how all of our differences make us unique and my perspective has always been yes we have differences but underneath all of those cultural differences we're all human and we all need to define our identity and we all need to understand where we fit in our communities and to me Walk My World brings that idea of we are all part of the human race before we're part of this culture or that culture or this subgroup or that subgroup and, and if we can find ways to connect where we are similar like through these learning events it's like oh my gosh how many of us love Doctor Who? I wouldn't have known that beyond this and when you start making those connections the kids see that too and it doesn't matter if you're in Atlanta or in California or in Australia we find these connections and that's what I think will make the world a better place ultimately that's the eternal optimist in me but really things won't get better until we understand that as people we have a lot more in common than not I think that's one of the first learning events we had where it was, you know, looking at your front door and then we also said, like, how do you start your day? Like, what, is your, what does your breakfast look like or your breakfast table look like? You know, and so I, I got on a, I was on a Skype call with Colin Harrison who is at, at University of Nottingham. He's like, you know, well, my breakfast table looks totally different than your breakfast table. You know, this is what a photo. Show me what it looks like. That's interesting to me. You know, what is... What does your breakfast look like as opposed to mine? Or, you know, what sort of different worlds do we live in? What similarities do we have? What differences do we have? And then we didn't stop there. I think as mentors, all everybody in this room who is a mentor in the community, 
we were all willing to take risk as a writers. Um, and that was hard. Like we definitely like, um, I probably have written more in this 10 week period. Like if I ever, like, I, I'd, be, I'd love to just count the words, but more so just in the risks that I was willing to take either about sharing very personal things or just feeling so miserably in public. Um, or iterating in my own learning, depending on, you know, what kind of mood I'm in at the time. But I think that's, that's something, I don't know why I'm getting the echo, I apologize. Um, that's something that we all created somehow. And there's, you know, there's a, a, a group that we started taking risks. And I think even if the students don't didn't do a lot, just seeing their teachers willing to do that with writing, will hopefully translate into their writing class. That's a really cool question that you have because it's um, one of the challenges that, that I've faced and then I know that each one of us has faced in our own ways. You know, there's this struggle with being an academic and being public and open online. You know, and now tenure committees basically say, well, why would you blog? You need to save all of your good ideas for like a really good pub and then nobody will read it in a journal. You know, but it's basically save your ideas, lock them down, um, I went to a tenure review the other day with my dean. I guess she's my dean right now. Um, you know, and it was basically, why would you blog? Why would you put popcorn videos up about your philosophy statement? Why would you do this stuff? Um, and so within that context, you're exactly right, Greg. A lot of us were not just writing and not just blogging, but we were really digging deep, you know. And so, you, you know, within that that challenge or that conflict between being open and public online, we were digging deep and, and really opening up. And so there is a challenge to that, you know, that you could write something that at, so, at some point, some tenure review committee or, you know, I mean, it's, I'm on the job market now. You know, people read my blogs and they look at it and say, oh, what is this guy all about? Like, why would he share this about himself? We don't want this sort of person here. So there's that challenge. Alicia, what do you think? I this is a big topic of conversation when when we talked about Walk My World sort of in parallel with talking more generally about identity a couple weeks ago. Um, I there have been moments when I feel like I've shared a lot. There have been moments when I feel like I've all I could see were the things that I didn't actually share. Um, so my, my Google Maps essay composition, um, there's a lot in there, but there's also a lot that's not in there. Um, and I mean, my general approach these days is if it's on the internet, I am okay with it being connected to my name because, you know, my name's Alicia Magnifico. There are not very many of us out there with that name. <laughs> yep. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, but... But it was, it was kind of a tricky conversation with my students too because, and you know, it's echoing for me. It's not just you, Greg. Mm -hmm. um, but um, because many of them are either on the job market this year or are searching for internship teachers yep. this year, and and that's a pretty high stakes environment. I mean, UNH basically hired me because they wanted somebody to be digital, so I don't know. I, I feel like I can at least claim at some point, well, you, this is why you hired me, guys, right? Like, I, I am putting our students online. I am teaching them about digital things. Um, I don't know. I don't know if that would even work. Um, but, it, but I do try to be reflective with them about what that means and how much you share and... I, yeah, I, I don't know that I've ever answered to that one, Ian. It's something I think a, a, a lot about, but, uh, yeah. I, I I've had that same talk with my students. They are, you know, they are interning in a school, and they, all the same stuff you talked about before about risk and their identity and how they present themselves, you know, they are interning now. They are pre-service students. They are not employed. They hope to someday be employed. And I say, you know, you need to have a digital identity because a principal or a superintendent is going to Google you. And we're at the age now, if you don't have that identity, then you look out of touch and they don't want to hire you. But then if you do have an identity and you go a little too deep, you know, then there's that challenge. So they, some of them had real deep thoughts about 
you know, here's who I am in this space. Here's the type of person I am. I don't want to mess with that. So it is a, it's a challenge. We're in between two models. I think that's why we kind of started with uh, Boyd's, um, you know, idea of collapsing context. In this. Um, you know, that, and that's what we were doing. We were forcing these people into a collapsing context all around, and they're moving from their, their social media identity of growing up with social media to I have to, for the very first time in history, really transform, you know, since they've been around, since social media has transformed that identity into, into, you know, into new professional spaces. Um, so, versus we came into social media already as professionals, many of us. I, you know, we might have played a little bit as kids, but, you know, I already had a job when Twitter came out. So, those, you know, I didn't have to think about that, uh, those kinds of decisions. And um, one thing that I did is, and I stole this from uh, Alan Levine with his uh, You Show 15, is I just set up a kind of a backstage blog, like a separate blog place as part of this is where... I could almost be a little bit more freer in what I was writing um, versus my, you know, main blog. So I encourage everybody to, that was, now I just have, you know, one more place to write. But it was it was fun to have, like, a, a place where I was just reflecting. On, like, so I do a make, and then I have a separate place where I reflect, not the, the learning, but the actual how-to guides. Um, and so that was fun. I have a backstage blog. It's called Kate Booth's. Uh, year two class. <laughs> yeah, it was her blog's awesome. Like everybody has to read that stuff. Yeah, it's fantastic. I, I was going to ask if, if this topic could have been one of the learning events in one of the weeks, or or was it in any way? This topic of it, you know, your identity online and getting hired and mm. what kind of footprint you want to have. Oh, so, maybe. it will be next year. <laughs> and we well, played, we, you we played with the first, and then we played with the third prompt. Yes, we didn't, we didn't go head on to the. We definitely asked them what type of identity do you want to have? What are the differences between your face to face and your online identity? Why are those differences there? We tried to really problematize identity. We wanted them to create a digital identity and problematize it, but we never overtly said, "Hey, those of you that want to be employed one day." What might this, you know, or what might others think about your identity? Um, that would have been that would have been interesting. I did it face to face with my students in class because I felt like I, for me to ask them to go online and share, I need to also be there to help debrief and you know deconstruct what's happening. But I didn't do it openly online. And it's related to my other larger question that I've been having, which is trying to get at. Um, what's at core of these experiences. Um, and I'm just wondering if you you can't use the same 10 next year, right? No. Experiences. So to what degree do, to what degree is this, uh, this um, you know, distributed classroom experience that people are getting, or get excited about in CL MOOC and, and, and here and, and other places? Um, it, it's necessarily ongoing, like the prompts aren't made ahead of time, or, or are they? You, well, that's, that's my question here. We yeah. don't know what's going to happen. Will people just pick and choose, or will teachers find the website, start at week one, and, and keep going? Right now, there's I was just looking. Some people are in week four, some are in week six. Or will it peter off? Last year it did peter off. It didn't. It didn't last once we um, stopped playing. But it'll be interesting to see. I know I'm going to be running it um, this summer with some of the Gear Up kids. I only have them for three weeks, and there's not really that much technology, so we're not going to do them all. Um, but I'm going to pick and choose from those learning events um, and see what happens. So I, I don't really know the answer to what's going to happen. Um, I mean, part of it is we, you know, we look at what other what's happening you know, in that open online learning space, what are the other MOOCs doing, what's CL MOOC doing, you know, what what's happening in the environment. Um, then it's, you know, November, December, get together with the organizers and say, hey, let's start these planning sessions, you know, see who's interested. And then, you know, it, it's interesting to go back and look at those videos that are up on Google Hangouts now. You can see 
the ideas take shape and how things, you know, what resonates with the group? What do we want it to address? Um, do we want poetry? Do we want different forms of text? Do we want, you know, identity? What, where, you know, what resonates with all of the group members? Where do we as a group want to head? And what direction do we think others should go? Right. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and whoever steps in, we we opened it up to whoever wanted to become a mentor last year versus like it was wide open. Anybody was allowed to jump in at the organizing level. Um, so wouldn't it? And I just wanted to identify also. I, I, we talked earlier that um, Rizo Rizzo um, for, fourteen happened last year, and fifteen is going to happen this year in CO MOOC. I mean, Karen, you're are you there? I think you are. You want to talk about how that's going to get started up again? Mm -hmm. um, and I, I actually, Karen and I were together when I think at the end of the first year. And Karen, I remember you were like, "I don't want this to end." And and but but so it does seem to me though that um, that these experiences having an endpoint is is kind of important. Um, but then that they have an annualism is also important. Um, so, any thoughts about CL MOOC and, and how that all fits, Karen? Well, CL MOOC is happening again in June, yay. So watch for that. Um, it's happening in June, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that there's an overlap of, of course, or CL MOOC calls it collaboration, but there's an overlap of that instance that has a start and an end and community. And, and I think that for courses to be successful, there has to be a real community behind it. And everybody doesn't have to be in the ongoing community. But I think like I felt less um, unhappy about Seal MOOC ending this year because there were a lot of people in the community that I knew now I had ongoing connections with. And they're not the same thing, but I think I think community is really essential. And I think that gets into some of the issues we were talking that you were talking about before about um, you know how deep people's experience are. And I was really interested in the discussion about if people were doing this for a grade, how that impacted on their um, participation and how deep their participation was. And that was certainly something that at Peer-to-Peer -peer University we spent a lot of time talking about formal credit and what the drawbacks of that were. So, Yeah, I mean, that's what, Karen, what, that's one of the interesting things is, you know, if people are doing this, you know, when we are assessing you, your motivation changes. You know, I mean, that's one of the, the drop-dead things that we know, but so it is this truly, if they are doing this for a grade, it is an open experience, but then what ultimately happens to the participant? What happens to their motivation? I mean, it's, for most of my students, all my students, they would not be doing this if I didn't ask them to do it for a grade. Oh. So then what happens to the overall experience? And then also as a side, as a corollary, what do we do about identity? Are we really thinking about identity and playing with identity? Not just Australia. <laughs> Frozen. I think that gets back to that issue too about teaching and learning being connected and how, how much people see themselves in what in which role and how they see themselves in the collaboration. Like if I, I feel like, you know, another thing from P to P U that I think made it really take off is being totally opt in and people people were there because they wanted to learn, like they really wanted to learn, and I think that makes a huge, huge difference. Ian, are you still there? Yeah, I think, did it bog down? Yeah, no, you're good to go. Did yeah, you, I mean, that was my question, is what happens to, you know, motivation, what happens to the participants and their willingness to share, what happens to their construction or reflection on identity because it is a course, you know, and they are great. So I'm just wondering about the, the idea of having the MOOC be a form of an open course, you know, at a university for grades and for credits. 
you know, as with everybody else here on the panel, I had to do tweaking to make it fit to the class and, and the, the expectations for the class, but it, it's weird. But it was this I, think that's, thing. I think that's something that we did that most people haven't tried before, really, is this idea of a global hub with all these local nodes, um, where we had kind of, you know, not, it wasn't just ultimately distributed, but there was the fact that there was teachers on the ground, um, you know, and, and there's that, and we were forking just little bits and pieces of it for our, our individual classes. Um, and I think what I'd be interested in knowing is the grades, when you look at the Twitter analytics, I was peeking at them, yeah, there's a lot of people who did just, you know, five, six, seven tweets, the, the bare, you know, the bare essentials. But what happens when you have feedback from another instructor who doesn't have to grade it, but is just, she's just doing it because she likes to work? Um, and uh, can that can that kind of be, can that balance out the um, effect that grading has on motivation? For not It won't for everybody. I mean, you, grading, yeah, you're going to get any changes learning. Um, but this idea that there's other professors or other teachers or other mentors that are reading and sharing your work, um, I think that's when the kids got the most excited, when just some random, like, if I, some random person just you know, commented on a blog or talked about their poem. Um, so there's that benefit of having this like global hub with all these different local nodes, I think. I mean, the other thing that I feel like, maybe we don't know super well, but I've seen surveys before that suggest that education students, you know, the, the students who are really comfortable with education in a classic sort of way are among the least comfortable with digital literacies and digital technologies. Um, right. And I mean, and this year, I really decided that I felt it was important to kind of push them over the edge and make them participate in a more global community. It's all well and good for you. This is awesome. This is infection. Videos. And, but have it be, you know, out there in the community. Um, so I think it would really valuable to learn a little bit more about how that actually works when people try to come together with tools like Twitter. So, I mean, Alicia, now that we've got two minutes left, <laughs> now that you decided, well, I mean, now you decided to do it, you wanted to finally push them over the edge, now that you see that it's near the end of, you know, the, the Walk My World project and the end of the semester, did it work? Did it, I mean, now looking back, what do you think? I think identity and delving into identity right now was hard for many of them, um, but I but I also think that they are a lot braver than they were before. I mean, I had students try out all kinds of different things. They tried out Super. They tried out the popcorn maker. I had a student bring a tool to um, class two weeks ago, draw, which I had not seen that and is awesome. Um, and I mean, we did some HTML stuff last night, and these are kids who started off, they're not all kids. Um, I call them kids anyway. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, who started off the semester saying, I'm bad with computers. And by and large, most of them have stopped saying, I'm bad with computers. Um, I had, I had one of them implement today's meet in her classroom um, and is doing her, uh, her semester-long project on the integration of today's meet and what students can learn from that. And she was like, this scares me to death. I'm going to do it. And so, I mean, I have some misgivings about asking people to share their, their identity online. Um, at the same time, you know, I... I, they took a lot more risks than they would have otherwise, and I definitely consider that a, a big, big win, um, particularly for students who were openly scared and openly, I don't know if I should be in this class. I don't know anything about computers. Like, no, stay, do it, try it. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, I, it's been exciting to me to watch them share stuff and to talk about it. Um, I'm going to ask people to have a last thought um, as we go around here, and we'll 
if that could be your solution. Thank you. Um, Greg? Any? Have fun yeah. um, saying words with images. It's too late. <laughs> yeah. This is supposed to be one word, or is it? It's, um, yeah, I, I'm interested to see. One of the things that Paul said is I'm interested to see where this goes next. You know, all the learning events are out there. Keep using them. We'll try to keep following mm -hmm. people on Twitter. Um, keep testing out and playing the learning events. Use them in your classroom without Twitter. Mm -hmm. Karen? I, I think this whole space is really interesting and has a lot of potential. And I think the thought that keeps coming to me through all this conversation is about self-directed learning and how we inspire and foster and nurture that. Um, especially in our adult learners. Kate, thanks. Me? Yes. Um, last thoughts? Yeah, great experience for my class, but also for the... Um, the and it hasn't finished, right? You're only on week seven. You have some weeks to go. Uh, I think Are you going to week. continue with it? They're on break. I know, but when they come back, will you? Will they continue? Uh, no, no, I can't. I'm, I'm, okay. Yeah, um, I've got a couple of other things, but for me, and um, this will continue on, um, not just it, but just in a professional sense because of the um, the community, the contacts that I've made um, with Lucia, Greg, and um, Ian, and you know, we're always whipping little tweets back and forth and sharing knowledge and and things, and it's great. It's really fantastic. And I always know I've got somebody to buy me a coffee if I ever come to America. <laughs> I'll buy you a coffee. I'll meet you in Ohio. America. Yes, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So it's uh, been um, yeah a great experience, uh, but excellent on a professional uh, level. So tell those uni students that uh, tweeting is good. <laughs> Stephanie? Uh, well, first of all, Kate, when you come to the States, I'll make you a cup of tea and I'll serve it to you in a TARDIS mug. <laughs> oh, cheers. Thanks, Steph. <laughs> um, I awesome. think one of the big things we can learn from this is that, guess what? We're all a little bit of afraid of revealing ourselves. Students, teachers, professionals, first graders. And if we're all afraid, we're all in the same boat. So let's just go. And I think if we can all be passionate and enthusiastic, you know, unlike me, because I'm so passive about everything I do, um, but <laughs> the more excited we get about it, the more likely people are going to want to, you know, jump in the water with us because, you know, you can stay on the shore and watch, but how much more fun is it to get in there and swim? Yeah, right. And 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 I'm I'm thinking that as I as I sit around and and look look at CL MOOC and look at Rise of Fifteen starting up and and the work you guys have been doing, and you know some of the work that I do too that that like and and others are doing that instead of like tweaking everything and saying you know should it be two weeks should it be one week you know I think you know we should all be making our own <laughs> MOOC so so I'm really happy that you guys are building this thing and and we're, we're all kind of learning from each other so I think that's pretty exciting um, but I still want to keep talking about that and the, the big issue I still want to get to is like let what if racism was the issue? Like, what if there were like big issues that we wanted to deal with? Can we deal with those big issues in this playful, thoughtful space as well? Um, but that that those are some of my questions. Um, and so, thank you um, for continuing this conversation. Next week we are going to continue. Um, a conversation with uh, role educators, um, in particular a researcher who has done some work with uh, migrant uh, farmers' children um, and so forth, but others as well will be joining us. Um, and um, I, I want to get Dave Cormier on this question of uh, what, what these spaces are about too. Um, so I've been inviting him, maybe we'll do that in a couple of weeks. Um, and um, so thank you all for coming tonight. We are, uh, this is Teacher Teaching Teachers. We broadcast over the EdTech Talk channel of the World Bridges Network that Dave Cormier and Jeff Lee both set up. Um, thank you all, and good night. Good night. Uh, Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Take care.